In the past couple seasons, we've done a lot of shows downtown, and by that I mean Chelsea, 14th Street, points further south, because that's really where the restaurant scenes move these days. It's moved downtown, it's moved young, small, funky, casual. It's a hotbed of talent down there. Upper West Side was always kind of a culinary black hole, to be honest with you. Well, that's changed. Ed Brown's opened up restaurant 81 here on 81st Street, just steps off Central Park West, right next to the Museum of Natural History, the Beresford, one of the great co-ops in New York City. Beautiful block, great addition. My Money Dollars for Donuts, best restaurant on the Upper West Side. Let's go inside, meet the chef, and get the story. Ed Brown, we meet again. We're here at Restaurant 81. You know, I love this place. We've known each other on and off in the interest of full disclosure for, I don't know, <laughs> too long, 20-some years, yeah, almost 30, a long time. Yeah, mid-20s. Yes, yeah, then we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, watched your career go from a young guy, two stars, 23 years old, Marie Michelle, right. uh, great French bistro. A long time with Restaurant Associates. You opened up Tropica. You were at Seagirl for a long time. Great seafood restaurant. I recommend it all the time to people. I believe we filmed you there at one point. Sure, a couple and times. And now this is, I mean, you're a guy who was a chef in full at the age where you really wanted to do your own thing for a long time. Put the package together. Came up here in the Upper West Side, which really is, an, is a neighborhood now that's emerging as a restaurant neighborhood. Right. Talk about opening up this restaurant, because in my opinion, it's the best restaurant up here. Well, uh, first of all, uh, this restaurant was a long time in the making. I live in this neighborhood for almost 17 years. Uh, my children were born and are raised here. Uh, I'm part of this community. And all of my peers' friends said, you know, you should open a real restaurant up here. And I said, I agree, but I don't want to be the first. And now I'm certainly not. Um, you know, you've got Tom Valenti who opened up West and Bill Telepan with his restaurant and now Dovetail. And I think they all do a very nice job. Um, but we undertook major physical plant space. We took 6,000 contiguous street level square feet up here, which is hard to find. And I took a concrete shelter and built a giant restaurant. This is really the first and only grown-up restaurant up here, if you'll forgive the description. Well, I use the word grown-up all the time because it's a restaurant that is spacious, comfortable, casual, but elegant, where you can hear yourself talk and that you get real food, beverage, and service, but most of all, under this giant umbrella of hospitality. You know, we talked about the design features of the restaurant, or Ed did, and I loved it when I first walked in here because the entrance gives you no sense of the space. It's narrow, maybe 20 feet, looks like a lot of other restaurants perhaps, but you come in and there's this wonderful little lounge area with comfortable sofas, you can have drinks here while you're waiting for your table, well lit, comfortable people gather here, have a couple of drinks. Just past this is the walkway to the bar, this really beautiful, sleek bar. Past the bar, you walk into this main space, which is beautiful. There's some, some windows that face the exterior that give you subdued light, but there's this really nice feel to it. Lots of soundproofing. You know, these days, restaurant popularity has to do a lot with noise downtown, and that's one style. This is just a real civilized, grown-up dining room. Lots of space, lots of comfort level, lots of space between the tables, not a lot of noise. You can have a conversation. You know, I still like that, and it's romantic. I love these love these banquettes in the middle, these kind of anchor the room, these four tables in the center here with a floral arrangement on the top. We talked about the uh, wine. You know, it's, as you, as you run a restaurant, it's really nice to be able to have the wine close to service. When people order it, it's not three blocks away. So what did Ed do? It's right in the dining room. This is where he keeps the majority of his wines in this beautiful refrigerated cabinet that is really the, the street side wall of the interior of the restaurant. Runs the entire way down, wait staff needs wines, it's here, it's temperature controlled. Another pet peeve of mine, you know, red wine served too warm, white wines often served too cold. Everything's perfect temperature here. Straight away this way to the kitchen and, you know, really nice natural wood floors, beautiful finishes, just a really lovely room. This is what we call the pass in the restaurant business. The pass is where the food passes from the kitchen into the waiter's hands. Usually the pass is in the kitchen. Here the pass kind of links the dining room to the kitchen. And you see, I mean, a lot of great restaurants do this every night. Fresh tablecloths put here, taped. Why? Because as these plates come up, there's no smudges, nothing from the kitchen that goes onto the tablecloth in the dining room. So you'll see in a lot of the great New York kitchens, when they set the pass up, they get a tablecloth, 
uh, uh, get tape down, put that tablecloth down. This will be here for service. All the food comes through here. There's heat lamps here to keep it warm and out through the dining room. Beautiful modern kitchen. You know, Ed was able to design this. This wasn't a restaurant before, so you know, being given a blank slate, he was able to design this. So the hot side line's there. We'll be filming there. And a lot of the food you'll see, again, comes through this pass, straight down this hallway into the dining room. Great system. So the squid, fresh squid, cooked in La Plancha very fast. Then it's tossed in a bowl with pimenton de la vera, which is the Spanish smoky paprika. A little bit spicy, very smoky. Uh, then we have chips of garlic, chips of chorizo, the real Spanish chorizo, so they're really crunchy. And what's the bed it's sitting on? And it's sitting on a little puddle of a very light potato sauce, which is a very Spanish thing with Gallego oil. Gallego oil is made with onions, oil, and more of that pimenton. That's a beautiful plate of food. Got the uh, asparagus ravioli served with chicken oysters. Those are the two little pieces of meat that hide underneath the chicken, the best part, and they're slow roasted and some shaved raw asparagus as well. We have the cured tuna. It's sitting on a little sandwich of cucumbers and roasted tomatoes. And we have a Mediterranean salad with cooked artichokes, shaved raw artichokes, radishes, olives, capers, and a little anchois or a thin anchovy mayonnaise on the plate. The rack and the lamb has sauteed lamb's quarters and a little uh, round zucchini squash stuffed with a confit of the shoulder of lamb and some more baby zucchini on the plate. Okay, we have a cold shellfish salad with clams and calamari. You see some purslane on top. The liquid is a gelée of a clear gazpacho and then a mussel and tomato sorbet. 73 dividido. So talk a bit about the food as you're approaching it now, because you're, you're, you know, not that the neighborhood has restraints, but because you're free to do what you want to do, but you tell me, what, what's the philosophy, what drives you in terms of putting this menu together? Um, what drives me is first, ingredients. Then, uh, drawing on my past experience, be it what I've cooked, where I've traveled, and what I like to eat. I gotta tell you that I have more freestyle cooking in this restaurant than I've maybe ever done, because I don't have constraints. You know, being in Midtown for all those years, you do have constraints. Nobody was putting them on me, but I was aware enough to know that, you know, the market in Midtown is some New Yorkers, some tourism, some business. Um, I'm happy to have all clientele at 81, but I gotta tell you, it's only New Yorkers. And New Yorkers are the best, because they want the latest, the greatest, and, uh, you know, sounds manipulation because they've seen the manipulation. Give me the best. Yeah, there's, no, there's no dancing radishes and there's no good. twirling whirly gigs. Yeah, yeah, the food looks good. They're happy to eat what I like to eat. And, you know, we say in the kitchen all the time, there's a lot of love in the food. You know, could it go one step further? Could that sauce be reduced a little more? Could we baste it and cook it two more minutes? Could it, every part, love. We put love in the food all the time. You know, nobody can open a successful restaurant by themselves. It's teamwork, folks. You know that. So what did Ed do? He topped Juan Cuevas and Yugi Fujinata. Juan I loved. He was at Blue Hill, Dan Barber's great restaurant downtown in the village. He worked with Christian Delouvrier before that and Ducasse, and of course spent a lot of time in Spain. And that's just the back of the house. In the front of the house, we have Heather Branch, great sommelier. She worked with Charlie Palmer, originally from the West Coast. She's great, and she brings that sensibility you know, from the San Francisco Bay Area and a knowledge of small vendors and the wines that they're offering. It's funny because I think West Coast was always maybe a little bit more progressive. Um, when I was getting into wine, there were so many women in wine in San Francisco, so it never felt like it was something odd. I think New York was definitely much more a bastion of tradition with the maitre d'. And, you know, now that, the, you know, as restaurants change, it's not the same restaurants that were around 10, 15 years ago. I mean, it's a new cycle of people coming in with passion. Where are we? You know, I've done this in past seasons. I don't think I did this once last year. I don't know why. We got lazy. We forgot. But you recall, I used to come in restaurants' walk-in boxes, and the walk-in box is literally the restaurant's refrigerator. Because the restaurant, it is literally a room you walk into, hence the name walk-in box. You can tell an awful lot about a restaurant back here because how things are stored, how clean it is. Okay, this is a brand new restaurant, granted, so state-of-the-art, beautiful. But if you look, they've got the pastry section over here, everything's covered, everything's labeled, you know, it's soigné, we'll walk our way. 
fruits are kept here. You're not mixing different you know, ingredients. You've got fruits here, sauces there, some fruits down there. Some finished goods here in various states, some figs. And then we come back here and I'll just have you turn the camera because again, this is neat. All, as, as all the herbs and vegetables come in, everything gets put in these nice plastic containers, sealed, labeled, so everybody knows what, when things go in, when they go out. All the stocks are handled that way. Same story. Uh, again, these are just, I don't even know what this is, but labeled, dated. This is a veal stock, obviously a demi-gloss. So again, it's the sense of organization. Everything in here has its own container. Everything in here has that blue tape with a label. Fava beans, cleaned, 629, lamb, uh, lamb bones, you name it. Everything's covered, everything's swanyi. These are little sauces. Everything's put away the same way. This is the way a good kitchen should look. This is the kind of discipline they have. This is a professional kitchen. Morel mushrooms, meat still in the butcher paper. Uh, these will, I guess, be part of the sous vide cooking, sealed in plastic. And again, everything's got a date on it. Even, you know, peeled garlic, odds and ends, everything soigné, everything clean. The shelves are clean. Beautiful walk-in box. Passes the test. I decided, listen, I was with Restaurant Associates, then Patina Group, same thing, for over 17 years. I had opened restaurants for them. I had traveled around the country and the world for them. Uh, I'd done a lot of interesting things and had an amazing job as a chef, corporate chef kind of deal. Um, and very well compensated and very secure and comfortable. Really not a lot of reason to leave that except for something that I wanted to do from the heart. Having said that, why do it only halfway? Back into the show, I went today to cook something. And normally I do his kitchen, his show, love this guy, been a fan for years, and this is a beautiful kitchen. What am I gonna do, go home and you know, make succotash? What do you have in mind for be us? Good, but it might be good, but we'll do this. We'll do, I'll, I'll get lazy okay. and have you cook instead. What so do you have in mind? We're making a dish that uh, I have been consistently making for probably the last 15 or 16 years, unchanged. And it's a simple dish that's actually um, an inspiration from Alessandro Rice. I know, I see the references. Uh, when we did the, uh, the little tiny, tiny, tiny uh, French base scallop ravioli. With a little thyme in it and a little piece of zucchini on right, the top. Right. I think I made about six million of them. You and me both. Yeah. So this this is my version of it um, and it's scallop and foie gras ravioli. So I'm going to start off by making the sauce first. And the sauce basic, you know, the basic beginnings of the sauce are a beurre blanc, okay. white butter sauce. Yeah. And I'm just taking some, some shallots a couple of uh, black peppercorns, a little fresh thyme, regular white wine, any kind of dry white wine is fine. Okay. I'm just going to bring that to the stove. And we're going to let that simmer and reduce. We'll let it simmer and reduce. Right. We'll keep an eye on it so it doesn't burn right. down. That's okay. something you have to worry about. In the meantime, we're going to prepare the, the stuffing. This couldn't be simpler. You know, this is nice. This is what you call an ice bay right? Right. This is because you want to keep everything you're working right. with cold, the apparai, especially once it's cut. So we have a big stainless steel bucket, a lot of ice, and another stainless steel container sunk into it to keep right. everything cold. So whatever we put in there is going to stay nice and cold. Yeah, beautiful got, scallops, by the way. have got a beautiful New Bedford sea scallop. So we're just going to dice this a little bit. Yeah, you can see that kind of nice the inside looks. I mean, you can see the protein basically just sticks together. Yeah. I have to throw it off the knife. Keep that nice and cold. Then Beautiful I have the foie gras. foie gras. That's a nice piece of the lobe of the Hudson Valley foie. Okay. Okay. And we're doing the same thing with that, dicing that. So, you know, what's the idea here? The idea here is that these are going to be cooked briefly. And while they're cooking, you know, as you know, a great fresh scallop, it's warm, it's cooked enough. Yeah. And the foie gras is a large portion of it is just fat. So as it gets hot, it melts and bathes the scallop in this fat. And then you're left with this piece of protein as well. Right. Little which, you, which you just want to eat medium rare rare anyways. Exactly. You foie gras. And all of that is encapsulated inside the ravioli. So we're not using a traditional pasta. We're actually going to be using uh, wonton skins which I couldn't make, I yeah. couldn't make that thinner. Fresh thyme, which I just 
want to get the stems away. Okay, I'm just going to chop it just yeah, a little bit, just to bit. open it up a little bit. Yeah, it smells great. This is the uh, the Maldon. Okay. Salt. Okay. British sea, English sea salt. Right. And always fresh ground. Every cook has it on the station. Fresh pepper and always black. All I have to do is get this incorporated. I'm gonna add just a pinch of cream. Just enough to end up holding the butter so we can make this into a butter sauce. So we've reduced the cream down. It's now really incorporated with all those flavors are together. And now we add the butter. We're adding cold butter. Yeah, the colder the butter, the, the better. more stable the beurre blanc. Right. I'm just gonna swirl that and stir it all at the same time, just to make that emulsion. You know, a lot of people are still funny. You know, they see you putting in a handful of butter there. You know, I've got enough butter sauce right here to serve probably 10 people. Smooth. Next, I'm just gonna pass this through a fine chinois strainer to get out all of the reduction matter. Now, I'm gonna add a little bit of this wine. Okay, so That's our burr. there's our sauce. I'm going to season it up with some salt and pepper. Have a taste on it. Oh, big daddy, thank you. Oh, that's great. Great balance. Great balance. And you can pick up that little sherry accent from the wine. Okay. Then I'm going to, something that I do sometimes is I'll just leave a little floater sprig in there. Steep. Just to steep in there and just give me a little extra of that fresh thyme flavor that I can pull that out later. All right, sauce is done sitting there, time steeping it. Let's make the review. Okay. We have the, the force, which is not really the force. We right. have the apparai here chilled. Right. We have the stuffing. And the dumpling skins down. All right. Just a little egg, bit of a egg, uh, little little egg wash. We're just going to put around the around the perimeter. Okay. Nice, good amount of the mixture right in the center. Put on our cover. Just, just press it to have all those edges touch each other from the egg wash. So what we do after that, though, is each one has to be verified to seal. Okay. Every single one at the same time. Right. That thumb is helping to make that perimeter. Okay. And also in real time behind us, we've got a pot of um, salted boiling water. Right. It's actually half water, half fish stock. So we're just going to drop these into our salted light fish fumet. And all we really need to achieve here, Mike, is set the pasta, um, warm up the scallops, and that's it. Yeah, this is in the water for maybe a minute. That's it. Got to pour off a little bit of that sauce we made into our receiving pan. We're going to pull them out. A little bit of that pasta water with fumet comes with them, no problem. Just like when you talk about making your pasta. Okay. Got a couple more drops would be good in there. Okay. And again, just like when you're teaching the people to cook pasta, this is still cooking here. I'm going to add a little bit more of that sauce. Okay, so these are cooked nicely. Yeah, and just the sauce just enrobes them. It's just that's it. It's not even on the you know on the plate much. It's just just on the pasta. And then Little just some shovel on top. And this is one of those instances of reason for being. The idea is the flavor of that shervil, that sort of parsley, fennel-ish yeah. profile, goes with the food. It is not there for, for put something green. There's a reason for being there. That's nice, man. Can I give you the honors? I think we have to cut into one of these. I mean, this is the part of the show when we eat. We get a little, a little bit of shervil in this. See that foie gras oozing? Yeah, you can see the foie gras fat. What a different color it is. That's that beautiful yellow. See it coming out? All right. Let me make a pick of myself. Jump in. Bon appetit. Mm. Bring back some memories? Really. <laughs> Perfect. And you're right. The foie's melting. Now I've got the shrivel tones. Right off the bat, you have that little, you know, the sherry from the addition after the reduction in the burr. That's a great dish. And, and, the, and the pasta has a job there. It's not so much about eating pasta, 
the pasta is to bring, bring. It's like, it's like a scargo bringing the butter to you. It's like the little <laughs> silky purse that enrobes this thing. Gives right. it a little chewiness at the end, but right. it just kind of kind of goes to the sidelines. Center it. stage is, is what's in the middle. Right. That's delicious, man. So. All right, I did the protein. Juan's going to do an appetizer using seasonal vegetarian produce. Fennel that's slow braised, beautiful tomatoes, artichokes, black olives. Well, we'll let him show you. With the black steel pan, a little bit of oil. Yes, olive oil. Olive oil. And the other, we just want to caramelize, give a little coloration uh, to bring out some of the sweetness out. I personally don't like too much color in anything. My food, uh, some people will call it white. <laughs> that, uh, I think that a lot of time when you caramelize that, and a lightly caramelization is good because you de develop a little more depth. A lot of time people over caramelize and really overkill everything. everything. And when you eat it, you taste caramelization front, but then when you go inside the adding, even the proteins, uh, you have so much, like so much of delicacy that get lost basically because outside is so strong in flavor. How did you cook the tomato beforehand? There's like a the tomato confit, a lot Yeah, lozenge. exactly. Little olive oil. A little olive oil. Also, a little of the oil from the tomatoes. And then from here, we play. Then. They can smell the olive oil. Very viscous, huh? Yes. Boy, you can smell the perfume from those olives. Fried artichoke. Fried artichoke. So basically, we continue playing with the same component that we have here. Right, and just different textures now. Some exactly. crunch, little shaved fennel. Yeah, it's a very beautiful plate of food. And again, you've got these wonderful, you know, that fennel, so you've got that nice anise flavor, little bit of arugula, the crunch from the artichoke, the beautiful braised artichoke, the tomate fondue, tomate confit, whatever you want to call it. Shaved raw fennel, which is you know, complements this flavor, but a different texture too with another flavor element. And it's really beautiful. I mean, when you played like it, smell that yeah. broth coming up here. All right, we got to do this because we always do this. We always eat. Otherwise, it might be the TV Food Network, you know? You never know. Yeah, see, this is just really slow cooked. Fork just goes in, but it's still very, very firm. How, how, what temperature and how long do you cook these? 185. How long? How long? It's all depends on the panels. I mean, sometimes one hour, hour and a half. It takes a long, long time to do. Mm. Mm. That's just so good. You know, aren't you? Isn't this a great time of year to cook with these ingredients? Oh, definitely. It's I mean, just so much fun. Yes. Late spring to early fall. Yeah, it's like gonna be that chef's heaven. Get a little of the tomato, a little of the braised artichoke. This is an appetizer. But that's exactly. Perfect way to start the meal. Sets the tone. Vegetables, a lot of components, a lot of flavors. That um, olive emulsion is really fantastic, yeah, that's too. Fantastic. Well, you said the bitterness is gone, but you've got the perfume of the olive. Exactly. You thinned it out a little bit with the broth. One, keep up the great work. You know, I'm yeah. a fan. Okay. We'll Thank be you, following Mike. you around all yep. night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.